Church, welcome to Stone Coast Community Church today. It is uh, November 12th, right? 2023. Cold starting to set in a little bit, so I hope everybody's staying warm. But if you're able to, to stand and worship with us this morning, please do. Please join us. We'd love to have your voices. This song, Come to the Table, is... Uh, kind of the theme, <laughs> right? Kind of the idea, coming to the table. And um, this morning, there was probably almost 300 people at Matthewson Street uh, coming to the table to get a hot meal on a Sunday morning. And uh, they heard this song. They heard this song. They really, really heard this song. Matthews Street is a church in Providence that feeds the homeless and the hungry. Every Sunday morning, it's the only hot meal in the state of Rhode Island is at Matthews Street Church. Um, and uh, a lot of folks, a lot of volunteers that uh, have, have, and there's a lot of volunteers that don't have. And uh, so it's about getting everybody involved and um, people find value there. It's pretty, pretty magical. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of struggling people there. And uh, we looked at some signs a couple weeks ago in church, and we held them up, and we, we saw the pedophile, and we saw the, the drug addict, and we saw the adulterer, and we saw the homeless. And um, Sean asked me long, a long time ago, like, why do you go there? Why do you go there? Because... There's beautiful people everywhere. <laughs> we all start out on the outside, the outside looking in. This is where grace begins. We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give. Oh, the shape that we were in. Just when our hopes seem lost, love opened the door for us. He said, come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come meet this motley crew of misfits, these liars and these thieves. There's no one now welcome here. And that sin and shame that you brought with you, you can leave it at the door. Let mercy draw you near. So come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. To the 
doubter To the hero and the coward To the prisoner and the soldier To the young and to the older All who hunger, all who thirst All the last and all the first All the paupers and the princes All who fail, you and forgiven All who dream and all who suffer All who loved and lost another All the chained and all the free And all who follow all who leave Getting up at 7.30, well, not get up at 7.30, but actually singing at 7.30 in the morning. Mmm, that's a tricky thing. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I got you. Well, I have a team. <laughs> Remind me to tie my shoes and things like that. Chose this song, Heart of God, <clears throat> as doing the prodigal series. And the second verse says, Come, prodigal children, it's never too late. Run home to the Father, let him clothe you with grace. Bury your burdens, break free from the fear. Step out of the shadows, there's no judgment here. See it in your eyes. So pull back the curtain, take off your disguise. Whoever told you you ain't worth a fight? The cross tells a story that'll change your mind. There's only love in the heart of God. No room for shame in His open arms. It's beauty from ashes. So come as you are, there's only love in the heart of God. children, it's never too late. Run home to the Father, let him clothe you with grace. Bury your burdens, break free from the fear. Step out of the shadow, no judgment here. There's, There's only love in the heart of God. No room for shame in his open eyes. Beauty from ashes. 
wishes, so come as you are. There's only love in the heart of God. Sing that God. again, church. Here we go. There's only love. Shaking his head, writing you off, leaving you lost. He's not sitting there shaking his head, wishing he never went to that cross. He's not sitting there shaking his head, writing you off, leaving you lost. He's not sitting there shaking his head. He went to that cross. He went to that cross. Come on. final song this morning is a song called Gratitude, and it's um, kind of a theme that, that Sean was talking about this morning with us in our, in our huddle, and uh, something I always try to teach my, my students. Right behind my desk, I have, we're going to have an attitude of gratitude, right? <laughs>
feeling is this table and this cross that's confronting. And we've talked about this table for several weeks now. 
and how it can be offensive. It can be challenging to, to sit at this table with the sinners and the tax collectors. And that's what Mark was referencing, the sinners and tax collectors, and we had people hold up the, the labels of our society. And I'm challenged to sit at that table or not. And yet I believe Jesus would sit at that table. And then you have the uh, Pharisees standing in judgment, looking at these people. And so I'm challenged by the cross to being in the middle. And for some of you, you might pull right up in front of it and just worship. And some of you might want to come over here and have a different vantage point. You might not want to get too, too close. Because as we get closer to the light, it shines on our imperfections. It maybe reveals our heart. And, and when we see our heart, maybe we don't really love what we see. I know for many of us, this is what this, this series has revealed. It's like my heart isn't where I hope it would be. I have a lot of judgment, or I have a lot of impatience, or I have a lot of whatever it might be. And the whole point of this is to, to move closer to the center to be part of the feast, recognizing that I am a sinner and that we're all part of this table. So let me pray for us. Jesus, there is a seat at the table for every human being. I believe that to be true. And yet, if that is true, then in my own self-righteousness, maybe it's hard for me to sit at that table. So, Lord, if that's true, do a work inside of our hearts. Do a work inside of how we see Christ, how we relate to you, how we relate to the cross. I pray that your spirit would be upon these beautiful people, both online and in person, and that you would do a work inside of every heart, soul, mind. May we lean in and ask the challenging questions because it's when we're challenged, maybe God shows up with an answer, even if it's an uncomfortable answer. But that's why we are the body of Christ. That's why we have one another, to walk with each other toward the truth. So God, have your way in us. Continue to speak to us. We welcome your presence and your spirit. We draw near to you as you draw near to us. And Lord, we worship you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Why don't you take a moment before you sit down. You can greet some folks. We're going to dismiss the kids off to Kids Church if, they, if they'd like to do that. Uh, and then we'll continue on in the service in just a minute. tell you all. I can never tell you all. Sometimes you guys talk for 10 minutes and other times you're like done in 30 seconds. I don't get it. I'm just going to roll with it. Welcome. How y'all doing? Great. It's a cold, quiet crowd today. How are you all doing? Great. Easy. Yeah, interesting. I, I don't buy it, but this is so interesting. There's a um, tension in the room. That's a good thing. How many people are struggling with the series? Raise your hands. Raise it high. Be proud. So the new folks here look around. <laughs> Welcome to Stone Coast. <laughs> we're, we're in a series called Prodigal God by the late Tim Keller, and it's extremely challenging. 
And this is leading into, I say this every week, that uh, for those that are new here, both online and in person, uh, we want to give you an opportunity to connect with us. So uh, the, my far left hand, there's a table there with gift bags. So if this is your first time, please grab a gift bag. There's a connect card in there. Um, it's an opportunity just to, uh, if you fill that out, we'll engage, right? We'll, we'll follow up and answer any questions you have. I think it's very important because uh, choosing a church matters. And I hope that you understand our vision uh, to love and serve others so that all might live life to the fullest in Christ and our values and why we do what we do. And so um, we don't take that lightly, and I encourage you to lean into that. Uh, also, um, we have a couple of quick announcements, and then we're going to do uh, today's special on the 12th week. We do a discipleship pathway, stepping stones we call them, so I'm going to talk, talk about that in a second. December 2nd, we have a huge event at our nonprofit vintage shop called Four Echoes in Seekonk. And we're going to have a tree lighting ceremony. We're going to have 50 memorial trees along the properties between us and the Gristmill Tavern. Um, we're going to have tree lighting. Uh, Carl, who's the owner of the Gristmill, is going to have like 15-foot trees both on the pond and also on the land. We're going to have adult activities, children activities. Um, and, and so it's just going to be a beautiful thing. We're going to have a, a, a choir. What do we have? 20, 20. 30 people in a choir, so it's just going to uh, just be awesome. So and avail yourself of that. Just get that on the calendar. Uh, this Saturday coming up, November 18th, we have a men's breakfast here at 830. I'd love for you to come out to that as well. So with that, I'm going to just take a moment. I want to take some time today. I don't usually give myself the freedom to do this. Not, even today, I want to be fairly quick with this. But on your way in, hopefully you received one of these. Anyone not get one of these? We can get those to you. Raise your hand if you did not get a card. Anyone? Everyone got them? Perfect. So if you don't mind pulling those out just for a second, and I'm going to explain to you, and guys, if you could put up that uh, slide for me. So just to give you a little bit about uh, what is this all about. So we have a discipleship pathway, and we have the stepping stone. So we, you know, if you would want a stone, we have a, you know, some of them in the back. It serves as a reminder to this commitment. Like I asked you during the week to be praying about this, to be pre preparing your heart. Say, God, what, what is it that you'd like me to commit to over the next 12 weeks? Uh, that, that one step of faith. And it looks very different to every person. And that's why we do this, because we take very seriously uh, to, to, to make disciples, right? Everything, whenever people ask, what do we do? It's like everything we do falls under that umbrella. We're here to make disciples who make disciples of Jesus Christ, right? And, and in that, life happens. And so I know you can't really see this, but this is on our website. And I do want to kind of highlight a few things. So if you're new here, we have an introduction course. There's three videos. It's new here, vision and mission, how to get involved, and how to get connected. So if, you've, if you're new, you have questions, please go on the website. You'll see some videos that I've put together. You can help answer any questions. We can meet in person. Then over to the right, you have the new here, foundations course. So we have a video on the narrative of scripture, spiritual practices, and salvation and baptism. So some people, you know, what does Stone Coast believe about these things? So you can just get those videos online. Um, so again, that could just be on your stepping stone. Look, I'm, I would like to take those next steps. I'm going to commit myself to the, the new here courses that we have, the introduction course as well as the foundations course. So you simply write that in if that's something that you would want to do. I say all this because we've done this. Well, I think this is our third time doing this. And it's so fascinating to me. Uh, <laughs> I don't think, I, I would say probably 10% of you have chosen anything from this. <laughs> and I find that to be interesting. It's cool. Um, and yet, it's at the same time as a church, we are committed to help you to take certain steps that we believe will help you to grow. And so, <laughs> and I don't say this like, you can continue not to do that, and that's fine. But I want to also highlight it. So I'm saying, maybe I'm not communicating this well enough to show you uh, certain things. So then we have the, the three black boxes, serve, grow, connect, right? So under serve, it's like, how do we be involved? So you can join a ministry team. You can serve uh, in the community. Uh, we have global missions, which that's, we don't really have a lot going on there. And then emerge mentoring and then impact projects. So these are things that if you're interested in that, if you write it down on the card, you put your name on it, one of us on our team will, will follow up with you and be able to tell you more about any of those things. And then under grow, we say be you, right? And so we have a thing called ULA, and I'll take a second here. ULA is looking at our lives, and this is something I encourage us to be doing on a regular basis. So whenever we do this, I hope that there's a handful of people, you know, 10 people or so, that would say, I want to do ULA, because ULA isn't like a one and done. ULA is for the rest of our lives, because what it does is look at seven key areas of our lives. 
you know, our fitness, our finances, all the Fs, faith, field, fun, family, friends, right? And you evaluate, how am I doing in these areas of my life that are critical to, to growth? And we'll have a little course on that. Uh, so if people sign up for that, I'll put together a course, we'll meet with you one-on-one -on -one and help you to do that. But what you do is you set some goals, you look at it, what's the number one thing I want to commit to doing? So that could be become your, your stepping stone, okay? So that's ULA. We have a thing called Find Your Why. Find Your Why is a life-changing experience, potentially, because Mark Twain once said the two most important uh, days of your life is the day you were born and then the day you find out why, right? And think about that, because a lot of you 40, 50, 60 years old, you come to me and go, I don't know what my purpose is. I've lived all these years, I don't know why I'm here on this earth. And I'm like, oof, that's a, not a great thing to go through all your life and not know what God has planned for you. Right? So find your why is a, a real easy thing. You, we give you a participant's guide, and you go through seven, ten stories of your life that have impacted you um, because those stories have shaped you. So you do some pre-work, and then we meet together one-on-one -on -one for an interview. And, we, and the interviewer just listens and writes down things and listens for themes and action words because usually as you're telling your stories, there's certain things that come up. We believe that God weaves those threads through your life stories. Uh, and then we help you develop and design your own uh, personal why statement. Mine is to lead and inspire others so that all might live life to the fullest in Christ. And so everything they do when I wake up is like, how do I lead well? How do I inspire people? How do I help people live life to the fullest? Part of that is the dead man walking syndrome. Like, I don't want to see people just coasting through life. I can't. It bothers me. Like, if I see people just going, they, you know, they just become complacent, become settled. It's like, no, no, no. Like, we got to get being okay, being uncomfortable. Because the best way to live life is this great adventure in Christ. So you hear me talk about that passionately all the time because that's what God has put inside of me. So I'm always challenging people to, to get up and live life fully. And then we have a personal life plan, right? That's something that um, comes with a book, and it's an awesome thing. We find out you literally develop a, a plan for your life, right? It's fantastic. And then we have spiritual practices, and we have online courses. And then on the Be Connected, uh, that's an opportunity to get in a community group. We encourage everyone to have a spiritual partner, like that one person in your life that's a safe person, that can be your accountability person to encourage you, pray for you. You let them know, this is what I'm working on. You join a community group, same thing in your community group. Community group leaders should be saying, hey, what's your stepping stone? How can I pray for you? How can I support you in this? Right? So check in. You know, every, every few weeks, check in. How's it going with this? All right? So these are just different ways to get connected. And then we have mid-sized gatherings, like the men's and women's breakfasts, things like that. We do some online stuff. Uh, we have awakening and breakthrough during the week online. So those are some of the things that we offer as a church. So now, with that being said... <laughs> Um, take a moment. You guys can throw on some music so they can just reflect a little bit. Uh, take a moment. Write something down. I encourage you. So what we do is, if you don't mind, you can put your name. Some of you do, some of you don't. That's fine. Um, but it helps if you're going to sign up for something at the church if you put your name, because otherwise I won't know who signed up for what. All right? Um, but what we do is we're committed to praying for you. So I take all the cards, and I keep them with us over the 12 weeks, and we just pray. Um, and obviously, we'll, we, we uh, check in on you to see, to, depending on what you put in here. So this could be your own personal thing. It could be something from what I just shared. But go ahead and play the music. Take, take a couple minutes, fill this out, and then we'll drop them off on the bucket on the back there on the blue table. And if anyone needs a pen, they're back there as well. Cue the music, men.
All right. For the sake of time, now I've given you enough vision on that so you know what it is. And before you leave, I encourage you to fill that out. And then you can put it in a basket on the back table there. Um, I'm going to share with you mine. And then if anyone would like to share how it's been on your journey, I know Tommy's going to share a little bit about his journey on that. But one of the things was it's been really neat for me to look at a couple of things that I've done during these last couple of times that we've done it because um, I put abiding on one of my cards. A friend of mine told me about this abiding practice, and it, and it truly has you know, changed my life. I, I went through my first journal, like literally, you know, like this is my journal, and I'm not a journaler. And I was like, um, this abiding practice has, has shaped my life in a very, very profound way. And so that was one of my rocks, just to, just to be... Mine will never be one of those, because I've done all those, just so you know. <laughs> Ula could be on that, but I've done all of those, so that's why I'm, I'm going creatively on it. So under spiritual practices, abiding would be on there. And uh, it's been unbelievable practice for me. And then I told you I'm writing a book, and I finished the final. That was my last stepping stone, was to finish editing the book. And so I've, I've done that, and, and that's pretty neat. Now we have to get to the publishing side of that. Um, but I'm, I'm excited about that because without the stepping stone, you become complacent. It's been a couple years in the, in the works here, right? So I said, I got I to gotta get this thing out there. Uh, and so that was through this process. And then this time, I, I was like praying about it. And I, I got another journal. Uh, and I, I said, you know what would be really neat is over these next 12 weeks, and this will become a life practice for me, but over the next 12 weeks, I'm going to only have this journal dedicated to life-changing moments. Bless you. Like, like things like, it could be quotes that someone said to me. It could be stories that were said. It could be encouragement, inspiration. But things that when I open this one up, it's going to do something for my soul. Like it's going to inspire me. It's going to energize me. It's going to remind me of why I do what I do. And I was like, oof. When God kind of whispered that to me, I was, it got me really, really excited. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Would anyone like to take a couple minutes just to share what this has been like for you doing the discipleship pathway? Because I know... I'm not looking for great stories, perfection stories. I know some of you are like, I don't even know what I did last time. And that's fine. I get that, right? That's one of the reasons why we do this, because discipleship can just do a slow fade. If we don't keep discipleship in front of us, anything that you don't give intentionality to just fades away. So that's why, as a church, we're committed to doing this every 12 weeks. Uh, so I'm just curious. Tommy's going to share. Anyone else would like to? We, we pass the microphone. So if you're new here, you never have to. Uh, there's no pressure to share. Uh, but the reason why we do that is so that our online audience can hear you. Because if I start asking you questions, you start talking, they won't be able to hear you. Matt? All right. Tommy, you want to hand Matt the mic? Hi. Um, this is for my 12 weeks, but it's a, a kind of ongoing thing. I'm going to try to uh, know God, do everyday actions, and... Um, that's it. <laughs> nice. Is that for this one coming up? Yeah. Or Okay. Perfect. And so my coaching would be get very specific with that, right? What, so what would be one way or one practice you can do to help get to know him better, right? Because you don't have to answer that. But if it's too general, we, we, you might not get to it. So just what's one thing I can do for the next 12 weeks to help me to know him better, okay? Anyone else? It's just a little something. I started a new job about six weeks ago, and I have a company work truck that I use, and some of the other employees also use it, and I leave Caleb on the radio, and now I know two of my coworkers are Christians because they leave the radio station where it was. Nice. So tell me, what's your... I'm not quite understanding the connection to the discipleship pathway. Are you uh, saying from a previous looking stepping for stone? A, looking for a way, yes, looking for a way to connect with other people. So okay. now I know these two people I can bring up conversations with. Okay, excellent. So now over the next 12 weeks, you might be able to set a goal. To how do I leverage those relationships, right? Something within that. Okay, anyone else? All right, Tommy's going to share. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I chose uh, contentment. And I was going to start off with uh, Philippians uh, 4, 11 through 13. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have known what it is to be in need, and I know what it 
is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Uh, some of the hint points I had on, for, you know, for choosing contentment were some things I've learned, you know, in the last couple of months throughout my life, but also to live in the moment. I think that's very important. I also think it's important for, uh, to practice gratitude on a daily basis and also know what fills your cup, you know, to what drives you every day, and I think that that's important. So it's definitely helped me with uh, contentment. That's it. Thank you, bud. So there you have it. Stepping stones. Contentment, that's a big one. Those are three, so I would have done those over three different ones. You know what I mean? Like contentment's huge, so I would practice it 12 weeks, gratitude, 12 weeks on this, you know, whatever those things look like. But I, I just want to give you a picture, a glimpse of what that could be in your life, and then we'll just keep, keep at it. The more we do it, I think the better we'll get at it. All right, I need to pray a little bit. Jesus, be with us. Speak through me in a very, very powerful, intentional manner in which connects people, mind, soul, body, and have your way and help us to be changed deep within ourselves. So as we leave here, Father, we'd be the light. We'd go out and make a difference in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we talked about the elder brother. And I don't know if it'd be you, but it was very, very uncomfortable. We talked about certain attributes about, you know, characteristics of the elder brother. There was many of them, but we talked about someone who's angry or the abuse of power or this thing like moral rectitude. And my whole point of this is to bring awareness to you, not to beat yourselves up over this. And that's what I feel like some of us are beating ourselves up with this versus saying, isn't this interesting? Like, wow, like, you know, observe yourself and say, my anger comes up a lot in me. Or, or this idea of like moral rectitude. It's like, I, I have to be perfect all the time. I've got to control my circumstances. I, I've got to do this, this, and this to keep everything just the way I want it. Like, be aware of some of the things that you're up against. But my prayer for you is that you would realize personal freedom. You know what I mean? Like, the, the elder brothers have a real hard time experiencing freedom. And so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about um, the, the true elder brother, right? So the father in the story is our representative of that. But there was, there's a missing character. The true elder brother is not in this story, right? And, and so we're going to go into that. But my prayer is that somehow you'd be able to live within grace, the tension of grace, and also wanting to live well. You know what I mean? Like, I, I had to say in my group, it's, it's good to be good. <laughs> you know, I had to say that to my group members because it's, like, it's almost like it's not good to be good. Like, if I'm good, then I'm being like the elder brother. And I don't want to be like the elder brother because he's a Pharisee, right? And I'm like, no, 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 it's actually a very good thing to be good. You know what I mean? Like, you're being Christ-like. That's an excellent thing. But why do you have to be Christ-like? Why do you feel like you have to be, right? Even that language, I have to be. No, you don't have to be anything. Do you desire to be? Do you love spending time with God, or is it a checklist? Like, I've done my quiet time today. I'm a good Christian. I'm probably missing the heart of that, right? And this is what this whole story is about. It's like, maybe the Pharisees were missing the whole point because they were doing all these good things, but they weren't doing it for the right reasons. So what does freedom look like? Like, I want you to be so free. Like, in, guess what? In your freedom, you will mess up. And that's okay. That's what grace is. That's what the cross is for. That's what a relationship is with Jesus. So have fun. <laughs> if you're not having fun in this life, we're, we're kind of missing out on it. There should be passion. That, like, all the gamut of emotions should be present because you're real people going through a real experience, and you're trying to figure this stuff out. If you ever figure this all out completely, those are the folks that scare me. Like, literally, it's the Christians that have it all figured out, and it's black and white, and they hold it before. It's like, this is the manual. No. I think God is much, much bigger than that. And there's a lot in the gray. And so enjoy the relationship. Enjoy the adventure. Enjoy the journey. Lean into it. And I don't mean, like, I have a kind of a, a weird way of saying that, but it's like I enjoy when I'm being pruned. I enjoy when I... Things happen that I don't like what's happening, but 
when I step back and I go, I need that to happen because that's going to take me to another level of my trusting in God. You understand that? Like, that I don't like the actual physical stuff or the mental stuff or the things that are happening, but I know that when I can step back from it that I'm going to grow and learn from it if, if I allow myself to. So that way, everything that's happening is always a test, is always a learning, an opportunity to grow and develop in my faith. And I find that to be exciting. I love that. But let this be a place of freedom Combined with obedience, obedience is good, combined with grace and forgiveness and life. Like live life. If you're not living life and enjoying it, my goodness. Don't make it drudgery and work like our Christian relationship should not be drudgery or work. You understand that? Like there should be a lot of grace and fun and relationships and all those things as we're obeying, as we're, as we're sorting out the scriptures and doing our best to understand the precepts and his principles and his ways. But this true elder brother is what I want us to get to. Sometimes it takes self-reflection, and I encourage you, if you haven't done this, to do so. The elder brother in this story shows up all the time. So in your life, where is this showing up? Is it showing up at your job because like, see, here's some of you, right, at your job. I've been faithful for the last 10, 15 years, working day in, day out. I've been doing my best. I'm excellent at what I do. And I'm getting passed over for my promotion. Right? And it's like, well, why were you doing what you're doing? Were you doing it out of the joy of serving God in this place of business? Or are you doing it so that you could be, you know, on the receiving end of this external thing so that somehow you could feel better about yourself? Why do we do what we do? How about in our relationships? You know, it could be friendships, it could be marriage, it could be uh, parental, whatever it is. But when you pour into a relationship, are you pouring in in order to get something? Or do you just pour into people just because? See the nuance there? It's, it's subtle. But, like, people can feel that. You ever, <laughs> you ever get resentful for, um, like, you've given and given and given and given in, in this relationship? And then you don't reciprocate, and eventually you go, what the heck? <laughs> like, don't you see it? And the biblical thing of love says, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs, but we ah, look at all what I've done. Look at, I mean, I've done this with this person. I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. They don't appreciate me. Right? Like, so, so that the elder brother and sister kind of sneaks in. It becomes subtle because all of a sudden I start making it a list. And now my relationship with my friend or my spouse turns into like, you know, a scorecard. Check your heart. I don't think Jesus, Jesus just kind of loved people. He loved people right where they were at, not expecting anything in return. Hmm. And then obviously our relationship with God. I've been praying. I've been in a community group. I've been abiding. I've been tithing. I've been serving. I've been doing this for years and years and years and years. And why did this happen to my family? Why did this happen to my son? Why did this happen to my wife? Why did this? Why, 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 why? When I've been so, so good all these years, I've been so faithful, so obedient. Right? It's subtle. The elder brother starts making it like, you, you owe me, God, because I've done X, Y, and Z. So where is the relationship in that? Did I do it because I love God? Or because I was expecting something from God? So evaluate those things. I think this is so, so important because this isn't to beat ourselves up, but it's an opportunity to grow and to discover, to bring healing into our hearts where it's necessary. Look at this quote. If you guys could throw it up there. It says, the act two, talking about the elder brother, comes to an unthinkable conclusion. Jesus, the storyteller, deliberately leaves the elder brother in his alienated state. The bad son the younger one, enters the father's feast, but the good son will not. The lover of prostitutes is saved, this should sting a little bit, but the man of moral rectitude is still lost. Whew. Anyone feel a little bit? That just doesn't even sound right. The Pharisees certainly didn't like to hear that. We can almost hear the Pharisees gasp as the story ends, it was the complete reversal of everything they'd been taught. 
It is not the elder brother's sins that create the barrier between him and his father. It's the pride he has in his moral record. It's not his wrongdoing, but his righteousness that is keeping him from sharing in the feast of the father. So what I'd like you to do here, so this is some of the stuff that we do at Stone Coast, is turn to a couple people around you, discuss that quote, and then we'll come back. Because I think this quote is pretty powerful. So have some fun with this. Two, three, four people. Just turn your chairs, whatever you got to do. Enjoy your time with each other. Have a discussion, and then we'll report back. And introduce yourselves if you don't know one another. This is a special question for all time. Here we go. Now, let, who has something to share from your discussion? It could be something you heard, something you said. Who has something to say? Stop talking to each other. Talk to me. Anyone? Anyone? Come on, folks. Anyone? No takers? Who would like to share something? Ooh. There's an elder sister in the house. You don't have to do anything. No, do you want it for real? Only if you want to. <laughs> so we were talking about how you could, like, sort of like the table a couple of weeks ago, how you could have been a certain person like years ago. You could have been the drug addict or the adulterer or the homeless person, but yet you've changed and you might not be that way anymore. You might be a newer, better person, but yet people still see you as that older version of yourself. And that's kind of what the elder brother 
does with the younger brother because he still sees his younger brother as the one who messed up. Mm. And therefore, he can't give him the grace. His, it's his pride. He can't see beyond. Mm. Thank you. That's why I wanted you to share. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. It's the beauty of passing the mic. It can be scary, but anyone else? So, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, this is something that we were talking about. Mahatma Gandhi said, um, basically, it's not Christ that I have a problem with, it's the Christians, you know? And why is that? And that's that, sometimes that moral rectitude that I'm not going there, I'm not going to be with that person. And Mahatma Gandhi said, because Christians sometimes are so unchristlike, you know? Yeah, you know, sometimes it can be repulsive when you set up an us-them paradigm. You understand what I'm saying? That like, so like this is the club, and and everyone else is kind of looking in, but we have it all together. We've got, we got it all figured out, and there's that that tension. Like, are you really open to all people coming in here? Because it'll mess up your little holy huddle. <laughs> Right? Like if there's drug addicts and prostitutes and, and such sitting next to you, that's uncomfortable. But when they're redeemed, to, to Lauren's point, like there are probably some of people in here that have been redeemed out of a lifestyle that would have been like, ooh. So that's why we're doing this, because this table is uncomfortable. I don't know that we really want to be sitting next to those kinds of people. Like, now you look at the person left to your right, like, you know, like, oh, what happened? You know what I mean? Like, it's powerful. This stuff isn't, we don't play church here. This is very real. And it's gut-wrenching. Because when I have to look in the mirror and look at myself, and maybe I'm not as loving as I thought I was. Maybe I'm not as accepting as I thought I was. Maybe I'm not as non-judgmental as I thought I was. Maybe I'm expecting them to do a whole lot before I welcome them here or welcome them to my home, or whatever that looks like. Them, those people, as if I'm not a sinner, as, I, as if I'm not part of that. It's a very interesting thing. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone know what the whole point of this parable is? How many of you all want to know what the point of this parable is? Just tell me what it is, Sean. How many? I know you all want me to. Yeah, you do. I'm going to tell you next week. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I'm not, there is no whole point, just so you know, but I'm going to give you what I think. Anyone want to guess? Go ahead. He's what? Ripping on the Pharisees, but why? Condition of their heart? I have to repeat everything they say just so they can hear me. He's leveling the playing field? Leveling the playing field? Their righteousness is a barrier between them and God. And that sin can be sin, whether it's a, a moral, uh, whether you're moral or whether you're a prodigal. Sin is sin. Oh. Just so they can hear. That we as humans, we. Why would you do that, Chuck? <laughs> that we as humans, it, obviously, we put degrees on sin. Like, my sin isn't as bad as your sin. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but to realize that your sin is just as bad because sin is sin and we all miss the mark and we put degrees on it, but God doesn't. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Anyone else? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. that next to her mouth. He told stories to help the average person understand concepts of faith, right? And so for me, I could be wrong, but I always thought that the story was kind of like a tangible reflection of God's heart and where he was in terms of forgiving and accepting everybody in the world that's messed up, right? So he was trying to explain to the people that you can always come back to God, you can always be forgiven by God, despite what you've done. Mm, perfect. Just, you guys hold on to that. Okay, awesome. Like I said, that's where the whole point of a parable is layers and layers, and you really aren't going to know the answer. I'm going to say this. The point of the parable is the feast. 
come to the feast. I don't care if you're the elder brother. I don't care if you're the younger brother. Come into the feast. Come into the party. All of you. Come into the Father's love. You're all welcome. Come to the feast and enjoy and drink and communicate and have relationships with and enjoy my presence, enjoy my relationship, enjoy my grace, enjoy my forgiveness, enjoy love, enjoy each other. Come into the feast, the kingdom. I think that's what he's saying because he's speaking to the Pharisees. Do you think he doesn't want the Pharisees to come into the feast? It's, it's, this is a stab you in the gut kind of parable to the Pharisees. But why? Because sometimes you've got to anger people in order to get their attention. It's like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I missed the whole point of it. That's me. Yes, come into the feast. You've missed it the whole, your whole life. You've been taught the law. And you missed the essence of it. You have to rattle them. What about the stories before this? Anyone know what the two stories are before this? Just say it out loud. The lost coin and the lost sheep. Why do you think he says those two things? Anyone? Use the microphone because this is a little bit more than a one word answer. Why? This whole thing is, we're only talking about the lost sons here, but Jesus was doing a teaching all the way through. So he started with these other two stories. Why? In both of the other two stories, someone goes out to seek the thing that is lost, and that is not what's happening in this parable. Mm. He's setting up his audience. He's, he's reeling them in. Because what would they do? Yes! They would think that's perfect. Go out. You go after the lost sheep. You go after the lost coin. And they're going, yeah. And then all of a sudden, you come to this one. And the person who's missing is the good elder brother. The elder brother should have not been in the field. He should have been running after his, son, his brother. Right? And they're not doing that. They're standing in the field like this. How dare you take your father's stuff and then take away from me because it's going to cost me something to go after my brother. And when it costs me something, maybe I'm not so loving anymore. Maybe I'm not so grace-filled anymore because now it's, now it's affecting my family, my job, my kids. Can't have it both ways, I think, in Jesus' kingdom. Come to the feast, everyone. But I love what he's doing here. Hmm. He wants the Pharisees to stop being here and start having a seat at the table. He desires both sons to come into the feast, and he's willing to risk it all. The true elder brother, I mean, the elder brother wasn't willing to pay the cost. And this is why this is here. Jesus is the true older brother, and he's saying to the wayward son and the good son, come inside to the feast. The hard thing is, the wayward son comes home, and this gets this elder brother so furious. Why haven't you thrown me a party? And the father risks everything. Everything I've had is yours. Everything I've had is yours. Come into the feast. The father risks embarrassment. He risks everything. Running after the wayward son, he pulls up. We talked about this. He showed his bare legs, which you're not supposed to do. And he runs after him and brings him home. And he does not let him have the, the, the speech, the restitution speech. He doesn't even let him start. He's like, no, no, no. You're not coming back as a hired hand. You're coming back to have a seat at my table. Come on in. Here's my robe. Here's my ring. Come and sit at this feast. And we said the other day, we don't know what he does. He comes into the feast, but we don't know what happens to the rest of the story. The father does the same thing. 
he risks embarrassment because now he has a feast for the whole community to come to. And his good son is standing in the field. How dare you? How dare you? After all these years, when I've slaved for you, I've done everything right. Father still wants him to come into the party. Everything I have is yours, son. Come into the party. We're left with, we don't know what happens. The story ends. How do lost sons and daughters come home? Do me a favor. What, the lost son, the younger son, he goes off. What are all his sins? Start listening off. What are his sins? Adultery. Adultery. And you can name th things that maybe you think younger sons do that he might not have done. But what are some things here? Greed. What is it? Greed. Greed. Keep going. Fast. Pride. 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 Brokenness. Drunkenness. Drunkenness. Keep going. Anger. Keep going. Disrespect. Ooh, entitlement. What is it? Lying. Lying. Self-centeredness. Go ahead, keep going. Anything else? Abandoning. Abandoning. Laziness. Laziness. Sexual immorality, stealing. stealing. Okay, there's a list. Most of us, when, what do we do when we confess our sins? We have a list. We're like younger brothers. All of us sin. That's human. We all have a list. Now, some of us, when we approach Jesus at the cross, we bring our list. Jesus says, I've paid the price for you. You're forgiven, right? First John, you confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. It's washed. Don't, don't raise your hand to this, but my question is, how many of you accept his forgiveness and move on in grace? Like free. Or how many of you make this list, you know, you know in your head that you're forgiven and yet you carry around shame and guilt? The gift, I always say this, the blood of Jesus covers up everything. Like it's almost like a hit to the cross when you carry this because you're saying this is more powerful than the blood of Jesus Christ. When his blood is so much more powerful than the worst sin you could ever commit, his grace abounds in every situation. It brings forth healing and forgiveness and freedom, but we stay stuck in shame and guilt. This is the plight of the younger sons when we go through this? Do we receive the forgiveness that's freely given to us and then walk in the freedom of that? Because he's the true elder brother. He's given it all. It cost him everything. You want to know the Father's heart? It's because he first loved you that we live this life in his freedom because he first loved you. There's nothing you can do to earn it or deserve it. Take away from it. He loves you, period. If the cross moves you and melts you and you go, oh my gosh, like, yes, I'm dirty and I'm sinful and I miss the mark and I do it over and over and over again. And guess what? The Father shows up every single time. And he says, come on home. Come home into the feast. You don't have to carry around the burden of guilt and shame anymore. I've done it all for you because I love you, not because you have to get it right. The older brother has nothing on the board. He's done it all right. He's been good. There's no list. How does the elder brother come home into the feast? Because 
his moral rectitude, he's still stuck in the feast, but he's got nothing there. I've been good all these years. Done it right. How does he come home? Anyone? How does he come home? Pride. But how does he come? Oh, say it again. He, he's filled with pride. But how does he come home? Let go of the anger. Say it one time. And walks through that door. And walks through the door. Shows his love. Shows his love. Abundant. Abundant love. Changes his heart from being hard to being soft and opened. He accepts the father's invitation to the feast. He accepts the father's invitation into the feast. He has to let go of his self. He has to let go of his self, self-righteousness. So Tim Keller, some of you are reading the book, he says he has to ask for forgiveness for the very reason why he was being good in the first place, right? Like that idea, like, because his heart was revealed when he said this. What did he say? All these years I've what for you? All these years. What is it? Yeah, I've slaved for you. You weren't being good. You felt like every time you were good, you were being a slave. That reveals your heart. Your heart was never in it. Because if you feel like a slave every time you did a good deed, that's that's what you felt? I'm just putting in my time to get what I deserve. And I'm just doing it by being very, very good. You all see me on the outside. You see me, and I'm doing all the stuff. I'm out there in the fields, and I'm taking care of everything. I'm doing what Dad wants. I look good on the outside. Look good on Facebook. Look good on Facebook. I do a little thing to my eyes, and they start to sparkle. My wrinkles go away, and I look good on Facebook. And I put a few posts up there how good my life is, and everyone thinks, wow, he or she has it all together. Hashtag blessed. Hashtag blessed. <laughs> And then I go, holy crud, like, I I know this person. (laughs) This is not true. That's what's happening. My heart is so far from God. I almost think it's easier when you got a list. (laughs) Hmm. I think we're going to, Mark, come on up. We're going to close with a reading, actually. A reading and then a prayer. Who has the microphone? Thank you. And we'll have everyone just stay seated. First John 4, 7 through 12 and 19 through 21. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who, who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love God does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. That mark. Thank you. Any, it's fine. It's fine to be unplugged. I'd like to do something we haven't done here. I do it online a lot. I want to give you an opportunity as Mark just strums and just plays just to be thinking about your place at the table. Have you been the wayward son? Have you been the prideful good son? Are you sitting here at the table? Sins, tax collectors, those kinds of things. I want to have a time of confession just quietly before the Lord I want you to sense his freedom. And so I'm going to be praying, 
And I just want you to sit with the Lord. I'm going to just keep strumming. Just sit with the Lord. If you come with a list, ask God to soften your heart, to receive his forgiveness. If you come with the pride, and I'm doing everything right, and I'm struggling as an elder brother or sister, just pray in that vein. And I'm just going to pray a little bit, but I just, just enjoy this moment with the Lord and get set free. Lord, so many of us just come in these doors, and, and sometimes it's confusing because we know, like we know the right thing. We know the scriptures. We know we're supposed to like live in grace and forgiveness, and yet how come I don't realize that? How come I'm still stuck in repetitive sin? Why am I still stuck in shame or guilt? God, right now in this place, I ask for you to minister and just confess quietly before your Lord. Just give him whatever you need to give him, whatever's on your list. Lord, so many times we miss the mark in just, just subtle ways. Sometimes it's the things of our tongue when we say things. And we're like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have said that, and yet I double down and I say something even meaner. I can be so cruel with my words to the people that I love the most. I got anger so built up inside of my heart, God. Take it. I got bitterness and resentment. Lord, I'm scared. I'm fearful. Like I'm, I'm consumed by the news and the social media and, and oh my gosh, the world's going to crash and fall. And it's paralyzing me from living life to the fullest in you. Lord, I've been trying so hard to do things right. I'm exhausted. I just keep trying and giving and giving and giving and giving. I'm exhausted, God. I'm exhausted. Lord, take it. Take it. Father, forgive us for, for turning the beauty of the message and the movement that you started and turn it into a legalistic set of moral codes. Somehow I have to be good enough. I have to be perfect enough. I have to be in control of my environment enough. Lord, set us free. Help us to know the love of the Father. Help us to know the love of Jesus Christ through the cross, through his shed blood. Let us receive that today. Let us receive more and more of his grace that's so sufficient, so beautiful, so life-giving. God, just pour out your blessing on these beautiful folks here in person, those online. Pour out your grace and your forgiveness and your love and your freedom and your blessing, peace and comfort and joy and a settledness in their spirit about the goodness of our Father. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. May you move in each person's heart and just soften their hearts, Lord. Help them to receive everything that they need to receive here, now, to be full to overflow with grace in your spirit. May your love wash over us. May we understand a little more fully about the cost of the cross and how good and how powerful and how life-giving the blood of Jesus is. Set us free, oh God. Set us free. Let go of shame. Let go of guilt. Let go of being right. Let go of getting it all together, having everything just right. Let it go. And let God come and be with you and minister to you and love on you. Say to yourself, some of you guys say, I'm worthy. I am worthy of his love because he first loved me. That's why. I am loved. I am enough.
Jesus, come. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like to come up for a personal prayer, we'll have uh, Jonathan and Amy will come up here on either side. Uh, you can come up for a personal prayer. Um, we just ask that you respect that, that time with them. And then you guys, please feel free to, um, we'll turn some music on. We have some uh, snacks, some beverages. Get to know some folks. Uh, if you're new here, grab a gift bag. Um, but, but God bless you and live in his freedom and enjoy this time with one another. Um, and we'll see you next week. God bless you. Thank you.